Welcome everybody uh, to session 2B uh, titled Adding Another Level of Redundancy to Influent Pumps at Vancouver Westside Wastewater Treatment Facility. I'd like to thank our sponsor for the session, Leeway Engineering Solutions. Um, if you need CEUs, there's a lady in the back, Mia in the blue jumper. She will stamp your sheets for you. Um, so I'd like to introduce our speakers today. We have uh, Brad Eagleson and Frank Dick. Brad Eagleson has a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering and a master's degree in environmental engineering and has seven years of experience in the semiconductor industry and three years of experience in the wastewater and water industry. He has experience in process mechanical waste and chemical systems. He also has experience with both gravity and pressurized hydraulics. Uh, Brad spent two years living in Paraguay as a Peace Corps volunteer and enjoys biking, running, and spending time with his three-year-old son. Frank Dick oversees sewer and wastewater engineering functions, including capital projects, wastewater system planning, interface with the city's contract operator for wastewater, Jacobs. Uh, he currently serves as co-chair of NACWA's Pre-Treatment and Pollution Prevention Committee, and has for years advocated with national and international teams to get wet wipes out of sewers and recently helped lead a legislation for better do not flush labeling in Oregon and Washington. Frank has a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering and has 14 years of experience in semiconductor industry and 16 years of experience in the water and wastewater industry. Please help me welcome Frank and Brad. All right, thanks everybody. Uh, just quick, I graduated from Washington State University just down the road. Anybody else in the room? So quite a few of us. Yeah, I drove here from Portland and uh, drove through Colfax and got a ticket. Just probably like other people did. So um, I'll get started here. We're gonna talk about uh, an interesting situation we had uh, four or five years ago regarding uh, um, a situation at our influent pump station at our west side treatment plant. Um, I'm gonna do a site overview and a little bit of history of, of the issues we've had with our influent pump station, um, and then start off with a problem statement and design ideas, and then turn it over into Brad to get into the meat of uh, design and construction um, of this thing. So um, Vancouver, um, the city's population is about 200,000. Uh, the sewer service area serves about 245,000. Um, the service area is bound by Clark Regional Wastewater District to the north and the city of Camas to the east. Uh, there's little depictions of our two wastewater uh, treatment plants um, there, uh, Marine Park uh, and Westside. They both receive about 10 million gallons a day. Um, into the treatment plants on a dry average wet weather, or I mean dry, um, a dry average day. So I'm gonna focus in on uh, West Side's treatment plant because that's where uh, this project took place. So um, a little bit of history here, the influent wet well uh, at our influent station is, is capacity uh, limited. Um, I tried to find numbers on exact volumes of, of our so-called wet well, it's actually, pretty much a straight channel from uh, our influent um, pipes into the treatment plant into um, through, through a set of screens and then into our uh, uh, pumping system. Um, the plant is a secondary treatment activated sludge plant uh, with UV disinfection. Um, it does receive primary solids and waste activated uh, sludge from Marine Park um, currently directly through, um, uh, through its headwork at the plant. We're one of the few incinerators in the uh, in the Northwest. Uh, we incinerate our uh, sewage sludge, uh, and our residuals that we send off are uh, it's a dewatered fly ash, much reduced volume fly ash that goes to to landfill. Um, the plant as we see it now was built um, in 1974. It was actually built uh, way back in the 1940s, but it, its current form that if you go out there and look at it. It's a 1974 plant with major upgrades in uh, 1986 um, and again uh, in the late uh, 1990s. 
Um, the plant was built with a bypass pipe at the influent, and I'll show pictures of that later, and that gets to the crux of some issues we have here. Um, and we're gonna talk about the influent surge tank uh, where this project took place. And that was added in 1997. And we'll talk about why, why it was put there. And then just a note here, we've, the city of Vancouver has, I think since 1979, operated with uh, contract operators, various contractor, contract operators over time. In 2015, we went out for request for proposal for, for uh, contract operations and Jacobs uh, was awarded that contract in two, 2015 and started in uh, 2016. So uh, our influence surge tank, so our design flow into the treatment plants about 28.3 uh, million gallons per day um, and a 41 million gallons per day maximum. Uh, like I said, we're receiving about 10 million gallons uh, on a dry day. And I think Brad will talk about some peak uh, flow observations we've seen uh, during heavy storm events. Um, the overflow, the surge tank that I, uh, pointed to is uh, 49,000 gallons. It's below grade, we'll have more pictures of it. Um, and there's an overflow from that surge tank to West Side's effluent pipe that flows directly to the Columbia River. And I'll show a little map of that. Um, I think the idea for the surge tank was to protect influent pumps and equipment from flooding. And it was also gonna serve as a second influent um, wet well for, for future expansion uh, pumping if, if we were to need it. So in that picture here, you can see, uh, this is an old picture, there's bar meters um, sitting there in front of the building that's, that houses the influent pumps. Those have been since replaced. Uh, the red circle shows that, uh, the, shows where if the channel overflowed, it would flow um, to the west, to the left, um, into the surge tank there. So over the years, we, both the city and um, the city's contract operators have known there was a risk to um, having such a small influence, influent volumes to, to control. Um, Jacobs during their proposal, um, they identified those mitigation, or I mean those risks and um, identified some mitigation concepts in their a proposal to us. And as I mentioned, uh, we started the O&M contract with them in 2017. And then the events that I'm gonna describe here um, occurred in 2017. So here's a um, map of the surge tank and a uh, bypass. So the green, I mean, the red um, circled the area encircles the in, uh, influent um, pump station at West Side. And uh, from there, it, the uh, wastewater is pumped to the very northeast uh, corner to our primary clarifiers, and then the wet process is flows through the secondary process. Um, and then gravity flows over to the green area, which is the location of our ultraviolet disinfection system. And that green line um, going to the bottom of the map there is um, a dis the, the effluent pipe from our treatment plant. So the bypass that's at the influent portion there is connected to the effluent through that red line there. It's kind of an easy depiction to, to visualize that. So the events that happened in the fall of 2017 with us, um, about a month apart, one was a utility power interruption um, through a complication of matters uh, caused a, uh, about a half hour um, uh, bypass flow uh, resulting about 395,000 uh, gallons. Um, it involves some uh, switch gear kind of timing issues and, 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 and switch gear um, things like that, that I, I could go on and on and get into, but I, I'll, I'll move on from it. Uh, about a month later, a totally separate situation occurred where we're, uh, third party, third party um, calibration outfit was uh, calibrating sensors and left, uh, didn't realize, but also left the online uh, level sensor in kind of a high signal mode. Think, 
so telling um, our SCADA system that uh, that the levels are high in, in the wet wells and, and to kick on more pumps to, to move the, so it did, but the, uh, the pumps, um, the pumps uh, pump the well dry and the pumps airlock. So fortunately we had um, an operator on site who kind of was keen to that and uh, released the air from the pumps and, um, and then was able to actually pump, uh, pump sewage and get it back into level control. So both these events were reported to Washington Department of Ecology and then Clark County uh, Public Health. So, um, it's kind of funny, this happened in the fall, and in the fall we get a lot of birds, birds that perch over the uh, uh, nearby rail tracks right next to the treatment plant, um, perch over the rail cars of grain that are coming in from Eastern Washington here. And uh, the, the theory goes, and it was um, has been observed when these birds fly off these uh, power lines, um, they, the power line swing and cause an arc and then cause uh, the substation at West Side Treatment Plant to um, temporarily uh, switch over or to switch over. Um, these are graphics that we presented to um, our city council just to help them visualize uh, the event and our proposed solution. So just simply, we show raw, raw wastewater going into our influent wet well, uh, our pumping system moving it to the treatment system and uh, treated uh, effluent going out to the Columbia River. Uh, and then we showed uh, just simply what happened in, the, um, in these events of the fall of 2017, losing our influent pumps. So the raw wastewater filling up that, um, those influent the influent wet well and backflowing into the surge tank and then the surge tank overflowing to the Columbia River. So part of um, Jacob's proposal and discussions we had with them during the proposal period was uh, some ideas they had to mitigate uh, the risk from, from that bypass happening. One was to do major upgrades to the electrical equipment, including the emergency generator equipment. We've actually done a bit of that um, um, separate from, from the project that Brad's gonna describe. One was to retrofit a, chlorine a decommissioned chlorine contact basin and set up some independent standpipes there and pump uh, wastewater from there to our primary clarifier system. And then the last one, um, put in diesel driven back, uh, backup pumps um, at the um, uh, at the headworks actually was um, a proposal, and then we we ended up moving those to uh, the backup pumps to the surge tank. And Brad will talk about that. So with our city council, we showed our concept that if we get raw wastewater in and we lose our influent pumps, it'll backflow to the surge tank. Uh, we'll have these independent backup pumps in place to move. Um, the wastewater uh, directly to the primary clarifiers and bypassing the influent uh, wet well. It makes it look easy, but Brad will talk about some complications with it. Um, the events caught, uh, uh, got some local media coverage um, and also some local tribal and environmental group responses. They actually held a, held a rally about a month after the last event in downtown Vancouver. Um, I just wanted to make note that our city council um, and our upline management was really solutions focused and provided any support we need to, to mitigate the risk of, of these bypasses. Um, just quickly on project um, delivery with the contract. So the O&M contract we, we had with Jacobs had provisions in there for to allow us to kind of trigger um, projects like this and get them into motion for design and, and delivery, um, uh, project delivery for us, including uh, pre-purchasing some long lead items like the uh, pumps that Brad's gonna show. Um, I was, uh, one thing I was gonna mention re uh, related to that is, I kind of forgot <laughs> to be honest, but the next item was uh, we also got city support from our building permits, um, just, uh, them really helping us along. They're a good group of people to work um, with anyway, but 
uh, it's been, uh, it, we had worked with them. Uh, what I was gonna mention was we had engaged with Department of Ecology on a schedule uh, that we were gonna commit to to uh, deliver a system. And part of that schedule was um, uh, working with them to present our design at the 30% level. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Brad. Yeah, so jumping in, jumping in on this, a um, couple of things I wanna bring attention back to is the OMM, OMM contract that Frank was talking about that allowed us to speed this project up. We'll touch on that just a little bit in the coming slides. Um, so with this agreement with ecology that, that was reached of when we would execute this and how quickly we'd execute it, part of this involves a study of um, the flows coming into the plant. Um, so you'll see that there's a couple of different um, designs that were looked at. The original 2000 design that you'll see has a, an awfully high flow rate of 68 MGD, um, and then a more recent 2011 one. Um, and then finally, the one down, on, down at the bottom that was based upon actual flows to the plant plant that had been seen. So we worked with Ecology um, to settle on this size of 34.2 MGD um, for the size of these, but we also took into account the expansion that would be needed um, if flows did increase closer to that 2000 design. Um, so jumping into this again, Frank had mentioned this agreement with a, Ecology um, and then kind of coming back to the turnkey and O&M style approach that allowed us to both um, meet and beat um, those delivery times um, as outlined by um, that, that, that have been kind of presented to and agreed on by ecology. So you'll see us getting the 30% design out almost a month early. And a lot of this had to do with being able to cut out some of those steps that typically go in with some of this, um, as well as um, final design being delivered a little bit early. And then with that went the pre-purchase of some of the equipment, especially some of the larger pieces, like those large diesel backup pumps, as well as um, the fuel tank that we'll touch on a little bit more as we get into this. Um, and then ultimately the big number that we're kind of showing here from when this happened to when the new system was installed was just over a, uh, about a year. And so just how quickly you can get some of these implemented. Um, Here's a picture of the plant. This is kind of our before picture. We'll come to an after picture here. You'll see off on the left, there's a building there. Um, that is a decommissioned chlorine treatment. Um, and then you have the surge tank. So um, Frank showed an image of this earlier, but you see um, directly kind of off to the right of this picture is the influent pump station. Um, and then where you see that red, red arrow is um, there's an overflow that allows it to go into this surge tank. Um, now you can see that the surge tank is particularly large. Um, we'll get into some of those complications and how that drove some of our design. Um, and that last arrow there going off to the right of the page is the overflow that would lead to the Columbia River. So that's where we did not want things going. Um, all right. Um, so coming back to the, the surge tank that we were talking about, um, it has a, as Frank mentioned, uh, a small capacity, about 49,000 gallons. That seems like a lot until you take a look at the flow rates we are looking at. Um, and you realize that that is about 130 seconds, seconds of reaction time. Um, so these things needed to work. They needed to work quickly um, and they needed to be reliable. Um, one thing I wanted to point out here, it's a little hard. I thought I'd have a laser pointer here, but we did have a early warning level switch kind of right at that overflow that'll come into this of how we were able to get these to respond as quickly as we did. Um, uh, in addition to that, some things that caused some additional um, requirements were this surge basin was actually designed to be an, a secondary part of the influent pump station, which means that we then had to utilize it in some ways that were less than ideal for hydraulic institute standards. And we'll see some of the similar CFDs that were presented in the previous presentation kind of coming up. Um, all right, okay. So this is um, kind of what I was talking about and getting into, if you take a look at this, this cube here is intended to represent, represent that surge level. Um, obviously the overflow um, being where it goes off the Columbia River um, and talking about some of these initial steps, um, that ultrasonic level transmitter that I just mentioned in the previous slide indicates that stuff is starting our stuff is starting to overflow. There was a, a 10 second turnoff that, that warms the pumps up. There's a period of time that the pumps take to warm up. Um, and then about this level, the uh, pumps are primed and pumping. 
Um, but this all had to happen very quickly in that about 130 seconds. And this is kind of one of the initial ones. You'll see that 78 seconds. We were slightly higher than that on the final design, but well, um, well uh, improved from the 130 seconds um, that we had. Um, a similar graph here looking at different flow rates. Um, the red line at the top being the overflow of the surge basin. Um, and then what it would look like as those pumps started pumping. You'll see kind of at the edge of this, some of the, some of the lines actually going down that we'll get into the sizing of these pumps and how we had to make that work with this geometry as well to make sure um, we could run this at constant state when it was running. Okay. Um, so we went, we were, and we actually source, so sourced, on, sole sourced on the, the Godwin pumps. Um, this came from a lot of work back and forth with that vendor. Um, and some of the requirements, these are some high or low head pumps with high discharge. Um, so we planned for two large 17.1 MGD pumps to get to that, that 30, 34.2 MGD. Um, and we'll talk a little bit later in the design, there's a, an expansion flange um, to bring on a third pump if needed in the future. Um, I mentioned a little bit of the high head, or sorry, low head and high flow rate. You can kind of see where we fall on that graph. We had talked about maybe throttling valves if we needed to, um, but they're designed to turn down to about 8.5, about a 50% turn down. So you really can meet a lot of those flows. Um, they're, they're kind of fascinating pieces of equipment as they work a, a lot like a pump on BFD, but it's, if you imagine a BFD being the engine in your car and being able to throttle your speed up and down. Um, they were provided with adductors, um, which helped speed the priming of the pumps. Um, and they had to be designed to operate without utility power, um, which was a big one since we are looking at a failure situation here um, where uh, um, these needed to operate independently. As part of that too, the early warming, warning level transducer that I mentioned in um, the influent pump station wet well um, was powered off of these pumps as well as a couple of level, transducer, uh, level transducers and floats that were actually in the wet well themselves and were used to control the pumps. Um, and then lastly, um, they needed to run independently of SCADA and they needed to, be run, needed to be able to run independently for 24 hours. So we installed a diesel fuel tank um, and we'll talk about some lessons learned with that a little later in this. Um, for those of you that were here for um, the other presentation here, we'll be talking a little bit about um, CFD here and non-ideal hydraulic institute um, layouts of this since we were trying to reserve um, the design for the influent pump station and that possible expansion in the future. Um, we had to work with a design that wasn't hydraulically standardized. It's not necessarily what we'd like to put in place. Um, so we similarly to what was previously presented, we took a look at some CFDs. Um, so a couple of things I want you to take a look at as we get into this. Um, this high superficial velocity, I want you to take a look at the swirling here. Um, and then watch what happens with this as it comes out of the. Um, so you'll see the velocities were high. You start seeing that swirl rate um, as well as um, vortexing within the suction line itself. So you'll see that spinning as it comes in through it as well as that high superficial velocity. Um, all of that is non ideal for pump operation. It could lead to cavitation, it could lead to pump performance being far less than it should be. Um, okay, so, and I think this is actually a similar design that was presented before. We lovingly called this the reverse Spider-Man, um, um, but it's a uh, straightening vein um, or a vortex breaker, however you want to call it, um, that was intended to bring that flow in and straighten it out going into the pump to prevent that swirling. Take a look at that similar CFD again, taking a look at some of those same things we were looking at before the swirling within the wet well itself, um, the straightening as it goes into it. Um, and then you'll see that the superficial velocity is about seven, um, seven meters per second slower. Um, sorry, yeah.
So it's still not perfect, um, but it was significantly better than what we had looked at before. And this was done by the CFD modelers uh, in our Corvallis office. In fact, we've got one sitting in the office of the audience here with us. So if I misspeak, you can correct me. Um, uh, we'll, we'll get to questions a little later. And that is a, a lessons learned we had. Um, so going into this, some of the big successes we had, um, we were able to get these pumps to prime and, under, and start pumping in an, uh, under 100 seconds. Um, I think one of them was 92 seconds and the other 96. Um, one of the big ones, and this is a bonus for um, Vancouver Westside, um, is that these pumps allow the, for the influent pump station to be taken offline um, for maintenance. That's actually something they're going to be able to utilize here soon as they're having uh, a leak near a, a flange right now on the piping. Um, and so they'll be able to take this down and repair that um, while everything can stay in service. Um, big one here was also that they were installed in under 12 months. Um, very quick construction and turnaround to help um, help with some of the concerns that were voiced um, and that Frank raised a little bit earlier. Um, a few of the lessons we lear learned talking about project implementation um, for those of us that are consultants out there. Um, we had a number of underground utilities that were part of this project. Um, we did some potholing before this, but as you know, when you do potholing, who knows what you'll find when you actually start digging it up. Um, we had a lot of RFIs, requests for information as, as part of that. Um, and we kind of realized at the end of it that there might have been some value in just providing the contractor an allowance to move those as needed. Um, we had a little bit of an issue with the fuel pump priming. Um, we had installed electrically actuated solenoid valves. Um, after a little bit of time, one of those had failed, which led to an intermittent failure on the pump starting. Um, those were replaced with man mechanical spring valves, um, which has alleviated this problem. And as far as I understand, you guys haven't had any issues with them since. Um, and then this last one, um, and I think kind of gets into a little bit of what this gentleman's question was here. Um, about whether or not we were seeing um, anything go through. We had installed a, a trash rack um, at the overflow as part of this project. Um, now that was all right, um, but it didn't get out um, anything near as much as you would with screenings at the influence. So as they've tested these and seen that they've been pumping out, we've seen some of those unscreened solids going to the primary clarifiers when these are tested um, on a regular basis. All right, um, here's an image of before. Um, you'll see the surge tank there down at the bottom, the chlorine tank, um, and some of what we had to work with. This is what it looked like afterwards. Um, and this is the same angle here. You'll see um, the two diesel pumps installed. Um, the chlorine tank is missing, is gone. And you can kind of see in the background of the discharge of this um, going off um, to the connection point, which was actually kind of off here um, a little bit from the influent pump station since we tied into the discharge of the influent pump station. Um, we've just got a few construction photos, so I'll kind of jump through. This is um, shortly after that chlorine building was, was demoed, which was uh, done by the city under a different contract. And then some of these images of in between, you'll see the install of those pumps and then some of the, the grading. Um, and you'll see kind of this here is this part of how we were doing that tie-in. Um, so to just kind of bring us to some conclusion, conclusions here, um, what we ended up here, um, the value was an independent powered influent pumping system to serve in both unplanned and planned events. Um, a, a really good application of um, computational fluid dyna dynamics analyzed to um, bring us closer to compliance with um, hydraulic institute standards. Um, the in installation of that early warning level sensor that I spoke about was part of what helped us to get these to prime in short order. Um, and then this entire system was installed um, and commissioned in less than 12 months. Um, and then the other kind of bonus that we got here was the ability to do maintenance on the influent pump station as well by utilizing these in the future. Um, so um, just to bring us to a conclusion, diesel backup pumps proved to be an innovative, cost-effective way of bridging the gap between aging infrastructure and reliability um, and can be installed with little or no disruption to plant operations. I think that is our last, last slide there. Yeah. 
Hi, everybody. We're live streaming, so we're going to have questions go through the microphone. Just curious what your power supply on your pumps is. Power. The power supply, there's a, a trickle charger for them, and they're bad. they have a battery power similar to what you'd have in a car. Um, so when power goes out, they still have a charged battery there, um, but ultimately they can run off of, um, run without power. I guess on that same note, why wasn't a backup generator allowed for this project? I can speak to that if you want to. Okay. Um, there was a, a backup generator for the plant, so they already had that redundancy there. Um, but since there was there was some aging infrastructure there and some complications with the existing one, it was more expensive to um, upgrade that. And there are plans to continue upgrading that, as Frank spoke about. Um, but that was about 7.8 million, um, whereas the install of these diesel backup pumps came in at a, a little under 2 million, if I remember the final cost of it. And, and I'll just add, this is a real third level of protection uh, for us to, to keep those pumps going. Nizam Rashid with um, RIE Consultants. Uh, great presentation, good job. Uh, I have some um, CFD modeling related question. Um, part of it for my learning, part of it that since I do that, and I just want to know that how other people are doing it. Um, number one, which model we are using? Are we using a steady state or unsteady? And how we are comparing the performance? Like, you know, like if you do a physical model study, you have vortex formation, you have velocity distribution, you have visual um, vortex measurements, you know, um, we find a way, we, we do a way, compare it with the CFD, you know, I'm thinking how you guys are doing that, I was wondering. Yeah, and that's a, that's a good question and one that I might not be able to answer here for you. We have um, in-house CFD modelers, um, so I've been a little less in touch with the, the um, modeling software that they use um, and some of the, the particular things that went into this. I believe this was a steady state model. Um, I can answer that much, but if you'd like to share your contact information with me afterwards, I'd be happy to put you in touch with those that would be a little more effective at answering those questions. Thank you. Oh, yes, please, if you. I did not run this model, but my team, uh, team member did that. And then at least as a CFX and city state, and we also capture uh, intake force differential, uh, score angle, and velocity distribution to compare with the ACL standard. Okay. So one of the things we do, if you guys think you should make that, but if you guys can take some data from the FLC and compare with the CFD, because what we are struggling in is... Um, the reason that, you know, at the HA standard you have right now, 2014, I'm one of the committee members, okay, HA member. So one of the struggle that we have with CFD is um, physical model have standard, CFD does not have a standard to comply with HA. We are trying hard to it's develop the CFD right. standard. Okay, if you guys can put some data because you know I, I used to run physical model studies and all these things. You know, we if we do five studies and five CFD model runs, it comes different. It, it does not get very close. You know, like we do not get consistent results to develop a standard. So if you have some model result, the results from the plan, if you can compare with the CFD at, at later date. And if you share that information to the you know, HI or any this type of forum, that will be very helpful. It will really be helpful. Like how the results that you did compare with the pumps that you have the pumps that you have. Okay. So that way we can develop the standard. Hmm. Any other questions? Yeah, I wonder if you uh, considered doing any grouting in the tank to curb, get rid of the 90 degree angles or would you have lost too much capacity to do that? I'm trying to remember, did we, I don't think we did any grouting at the time. I think we likely looked at a little bit of that in the CFD analysis and found that it wasn't as effective as the reverse Spider-Man. And then to that kind of point too, there was some concerns about um, further reducing the size of that wet well as it was only 49,000 um, gallons, and we had such a short reaction time. Uh, 
All right, we have a question from the chat. Have there been any events that have utilized the backup pump since their installation? No. <laughs> um, there, there haven't. So a couple things. One is um, we do uh, hydraulically test the pumps, and I believe we've actually allowed suits to backflow to it and test the pumps that way. The other thing is on the overflow, and I was expecting a question from someone, but on the overflow to the Columbia River from the surge tank, we did put a gate valve there. Um, and then uh, the operators and I, or the, the, there's teams of operators that, and I that um, argue back and forth whether to leave it open or leave it closed. So I think, I think, yeah, I think, I think we generally feel more comfortable with that thing, thing closed. But we have to be conscious of, of if if the third backup level system fails somehow, um, you know we can't like forever lose our pumps and have a worse situation kind of thing. I heard that. <laughs> oh. Um, we didn't have to resort to that. And I, I didn't talk about it, but uh, our local uh, utility, Clark Public Utilities, um, they, they, they did some bracing to the wires so they wouldn't, wouldn't swing. And I think they tensioned them up uh, also, but they, they responded um, to their part uh, very quickly. We were really uh, not careful, but conscious to not point at them because really, the problems at the plant in our issue, and we should be able to handle um, power outages no matter what the the situation. But yeah, they did um, they did their part in terms of uh, bracing those things. I think birds still fly, but well, the point you don't want to scare them either is that's when the problems happen. <laughs> yeah, I think the theory went that the train horns would go off, scare them, and then they fly off. It's in the these these events happened in the fall when we had grain loads of uh, or train loads of grain, um, you know, and they're just perched up there feeding off those those big yeah. bird feeders. So when they get scared, um, they all fly off at the same time, and the wires move. Um, that was part of the problem that they ran into. We have a couple minutes left. Any last questions? All right. Thank you. Oh, sorry. I saw. Ooh. No? Okay. Ooh. All right. Thank you to our yeah. presenters. Yeah.